Harry Potter actor turned author and activist Bonnie Wright will go under the spotlight in just a moment. And we'll hear a special stripped down track from award winning singer songwriter Mizey. All of that and more on the way. So sit back and relax. And still with me on my news feeder is Matt Johnson and Lara Podelska. And this morning we've been finding out what you've achieved first time round. When you achieved perfection, perfection the first time you did it. Now Kim says, I'm 51 and I played beer pong for the first time last summer and I aced it. Great game. But I don't think I've played it since I was about 18. Uh, Phil says, I mastered my parachute jump first time round. Well, that's, that's good to know, Phil. <laughs> uh, keep them coming, 85058 on text or at BBC Five Live on Twitter. Remember, do leave your name. Uh, we'll give you a shout out. Um, and the reason we're asking for these stories of when you nailed it at your first time, it's because of my next guest, who was just nine years old when she was cast in one of the biggest film franchises of all time. And it was her very first acting audition. She subsequently spent a decade playing Ginny Weasley in Harry Potter, moving from peripheral character to principal love interest and gaining a very large fan base along the way. After finishing at Hogwarts, she studied for a degree in filmmaking, wrote and produced her first film, which earned a spot at the Cannes Film Festival, and she directed Scarlett Johansson's music video. She's also a keen advocate for the environment, working with Greenpeace and the Rainforest Alliance on their campaigns to halt climate change. Building on that passion, she's just published her first book, Go Gently, Actionable Steps to Nurture Yourself and the Planet. Right now it's time to put the multi-talented Bonnie Wright under the spotlight. Bonnie Wright, welcome to Under the Spotlight. How are you? Thank you. I'm very good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, Next question, where are you? Uh, Yeah, I'm in California, in San Diego. Is that where you're based now? Yes, I am. I have been based on the West Coast here for like Mm -hmm. five, six years. One of the reasons I kind of want to kind of set up where you are as well, because first of all, I want to say congratulations. You got married recently. Yes, I did. Thank you. I know, you did. Congratulations. But also, congratulations on your book. Thank you. Uh, Go Gently, Actionable Steps to Nurture Yourself and the Planet. And I wanted to ask about where you are now, because obviously where you live now, nature feels very close to you by the sea and the air. And do you think that is something that kind of has made you more conscious as opposed to maybe being in the UK? Or is it something that has always been on your radar? Yeah, it's a good question. I think always, I mean, I grew up right in the middle and centre of London in East London. And I think mm-hmm. without realising it, you know, we're quite fortunate in London that there are actually a lot of green spaces that you kind of can notice changing. I think being aware of shifts and changes in the environment, I think is that first kind of awareness towards the kind of urgency of the issue. And I also spent, my family have a house on the south coast of England. So I spent a lot of time on the beach down in East Sussex. So even in that environment was the kind of first environment, actually, I saw sort of single-use plastic pollution essentially kind of beginning to be more of a problem on the beaches. The timing of this book as well, because it is something that we're all a little bit more conscious of, but again, not sure what we should do. There are so many things when it comes to climate change and, and, and things are going on where we feel like we shouldn't go gently. We have to kind of push. Why go gently? What does that mean? What, what does that mean in the title? Well, for me, when I first got really concerned for the environment and really anxious to to be part of the change I wanted to see and do things, I think we we take that kind of anger and frustration and we go like full throttle and we go for it. And then we realise change doesn't happen that quickly in terms of big systemic government, corporate change. So you can end up feeling pretty disheartened, upset and kind of feel like nothing you ever do kind of will make a difference. So I have found in order to sustain my actions over time and commit to a lifetime of this work, because that's how long it's going to take, I have found that I need to also look after like myself, my mental health, and also know that small things that I can actually keep up with are more lasting over time than, you know, we often hear different people kind of feeling burnout or, or different things like that. So the go gently you know, go, that's still kind of affirmative, like, go now, go do something, but with a gentle approach so that it can be more sustained over time. And the kind of hard and soft mentality we should bring to everything. Like, I think whilst we can get kind of frustrated and angry, 
Mm. Also, if we don't do that with kind of compassion, it can be pretty joyless space to be in. So, so that's the kind of intention behind the title. It's really interesting. And, and yeah, I think when it, sometimes when it comes to this, you kind of think it's them and also you're either doing it right or you're doing it wrong. There's nowhere mm-hmm. in between. And this is, you know, something we've talked about on this show before. I remember talking to Benedict Cumberbatch, first of all, mm-hmm. on the show about being a vegan. He's like, oh, well, I'm not really a vegan anymore. I tried it for a while, but it didn't work out. But I'm afraid if I if I say I am and I'm, I'm caught eating something that's not vegan, I'll get in trouble. And, <laughs> and, and it's this kind of, oh, I better not do it wrong or I'll get attacked. And it, it's not about that. It's about those small changes and the small things you can do. Evie Lynch, um, who your former client, Mm -hmm. who you know obviously she said the same thing sometimes it's you want to do something but if you can't do it 100% you feel you can do nothing at all is that something that we need to kind of change that it's not them and us we're all in it for the for the overall good purpose yeah exactly I mean just that kind of not striving for like perfectionism I think we've Mm -hmm. obviously been kind of very much given that model even a stereotypical idea of an activist is like someone who's like their whole life is just kind of given to the cause, which obviously some people can do and will do. But the reality of integrating that into your day to day life is pretty hard. And the worst thing you want to do, like you say, is feel bad or shamed into doing something that actually doesn't quite work for your life or identity or different things. So I think for like you're saying that us and them, I think it's like mm. bringing that humanism to it and realizing that the people on boardroom tables or in cabinets of government are like individuals as well who kind Mm -hmm. of we want to be hopeful that we'll step towards doing the right thing um but yeah in the book I really talk about that kind of there is no right or wrong good or bad like choice or action there's so much more nuance and gray area to everything and really all we can do is just be more informed to make more intentional choices so what is the process of writing a book like this? Because as you said, there is a lot of grey area and um, mm-hmm. there is a lot of confusion. How? What was your process of putting this together? Because to try and compile it into a digestible book, I'm sure yeah. it would have been huge. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. And I think, you know, there's, there's always going to be something that isn't included in there or that I'm mm-hmm. going to continue to learn and wish I had kind of included. I mean, the title of the book really came fully formed when the idea was coming about. And each mm-hmm. chapter in the book is kind of go something as well. But I think it was an interesting, like, practice just for myself to be kind of vulnerable in the writing process of unlearning and relearning things that I thought Mm. I kind of, like, knew. I think Mm. there's so much, like, with with these nuances to learn and how I also interview people in the book Mm -hmm. and how their sort of those conversations I had through the process of writing, like, shifted and opened up my perspective more. And I, you know, opted to get those interviews in there so that readers could maybe see themselves more maybe in in someone I interviewed than than me but yeah it was challenging I mean I think there was one draft where I had to cut like 20,000 words out of it or something I never thought I would ever write a book so you know I have nothing to compare the experience to so it was all new and uh now it feels quite surreal that it's I managed to get it down into a printed printed thing I mean, it's a huge thing to be proud of. Has it given you a taste for it? Yeah, I've always, you know, this is obviously a non-fiction book and I've always mm-hmm. come from a background of fictional storytelling and I do love fiction. So I'd be very interested to see how much harder and different maybe like fiction writing would be. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I feel like Go Gently could lead itself to different editions as, like I said, so many more things come you know, about as solutions around around this issue. I'm Laura Whitmore and Under the Spotlight is actor, director and now author Bonnie Wright. Uh, I mentioned Ivana Lynch mm-hmm. and um, someone else as well, Emma Watson. I've spoken to both before and I know you've all come from the, the school of Harry Potter, literally, mm-hmm. but all seem to be incredibly conscious women who have used their platform to talk out about issues. And I'm wondering, was that something like on set? Because a lot of people use their platform or their their fame to do lots of other different things. But there does seem to be, particularly with, with the women associated um, and, and the actors in it, that the, they kind of are very conscious about the world around them and aware that they have a lot of, of ears listening. Yeah, it's true. I feel like, yeah, we, the three of us always question that. Like, it's so interesting (laughs) that we've all gone and like taken an issue that we're really passionate about. Yeah. I feel like it could just be our own like characters, honestly. I feel like each of us kind of are a part of our 
ourselves as who we are, but we also, you know, must have some traits of our actual characters from Harry Potter. Like that must Mm -hmm. kind of been a reason we were cast in each of our roles. And you can so imagine Hermione, Luna and Ginny like doing something, you know. So it kind of feels quite reflective of our characters. And yeah, and I think it's not something that any of us have done feeling like we should because we have that platform. You know, it feels Mm -hmm. a very kind of a natural curiosity and compassion towards each issue we care about that then we're fortunate enough to then have a platform to like amplify that quite significantly. Do you feel you have a responsibility as well because of the amount of people who follow you and listen to you? Um, Yeah, of course. I mean, always. And I think being sensitive to what you say is also kind of very important just so that you really like understand what you're talking about. And I think that's what was great about the process of writing the book. It really like pushed me to focus on the education around the issue while I was talking about it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, you know, you're always going, there's always going to be someone who disagrees with you. I think you can't like, I think you have to kind of not try and be too much of a like people pleaser. Otherwise it's going to be a miserable, a miserable ride. So, but it's also been amazing just to see people who obviously could be following me because of Harry Potter, but then they're very much within the generations that are deeply concerned about this issue. So people have always been very kind of quick to sort of respond to stuff I share about actions that we can take around the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's really was one of the encouraging reasons for me to think that people would want to read the book, you know, was that kind of positive approach to the things I was suggesting. I want to go back to something that you touched on and it was about your character in Harry Potter, that there must have been a part of all of you that are in your character. You know, that's why you got the role. What was the audition process of that? My older brother, Lewis, had read the first two books because I was nine yeah. when I auditioned. And he'd read the first two books and he was very like, you should play the role of Ginny Weasley. Like, it was very specific. Really? Yeah. From the start is always yeah. the way. Clever, <laughs> and clever. Because we had heard that people, they were, you know, making them into films and mm. they were doing auditions. So my mum came home from work and my brother and I were like, we need to get an audition for Harry Potter. So were you acting at this stage? Not at all. Just very specifically driven to this one thing. <laughs> And so my mum like called the publishing company and they gave the number to the like casting director. And then I had to like send in some pictures of myself and like a sentence of what character I wanted to play and why. Mm -hmm. And so I came into the audition and at the time in the first film, Ginny didn't have like any lines really. So I came in and I had to read, I think, Hermione lines for the audition. And I did two auditions and then I got the part and I was not expecting it I was like there's going to be people in here who have been acting since they were like crawling on the floor you know I'm not going to get this so it was all very much a surprise like my brother and I were just mainly just like wanted to go for an audition because we were curious like what's an audition you know yeah so it was all very new and like the first day on set I had no idea what I was doing or like what anything technically was Mm -hmm. so so yeah it was a big shaping experience also really interesting though because that was your first audition and, and you got it yeah so it kind of probably gives you this expectation that most actors don't have a lot of actors <laughs> get a lot of knocks yeah. before they get a yes so are you like oh well that's that's this is easy <laughs> yeah this is great like what's the next thing yeah it's like uh, what book will I read and say I want to play that part yeah exactly get my brother to start reading all the books in the world to find my roles <laughs> how do you reflect on that time and the whirlwind as, as you said like you know Ginny's role in, in in the first film it's smaller and then it grows and grows and grows how was it with each and every film yeah it was kind of strange having the books come out as we were making the films and they were like yeah. a little bit ahead of what we were making yeah so you're like oh yes she's in it more she's in it more yeah you're like, oh, like, oh gosh, is she going to like survive, you know? Or people would be like reading them quicker than you and they'd be like, have you got to page 602? You're like, no, why? What happens on there? So it'd be this kind of nervous, you know, you'd read it the first time and you'd kind of, similar to when the films came out, you have to kind of like watch them a couple of times before you like didn't just think about the memories or filming it and you actually saw it as a story. Yeah. But it was kind of, yeah, strange and kind of good in a way that we all didn't know the full kind of fate, I guess, of the characters because they kind of evolved yeah. with us and it felt more realistic, I guess. But yeah, I was thankful and excited, obviously, that my character sort of grew to to what she did. Iconic. Uh, mm-hmm. It was a 20th anniversary reunion special recently. What was it like to kind of all get back together again? It was so fun. I honestly never, to actually get us all in the same place at the same time was an achievement. Mm-hmm. And it was something that I didn't 
think would happen, or maybe I did, but not for kind of a while. It was just like a very kind of balance between a whole new thing and just we all slipped into our roles and we were kind of back filming again. And unusual that you get to step on a, a set that you filmed on. Um, you know, most sets just yeah. take it down and that's the, re- the end of them. So it was super fun. I mean, just reflecting together on the whole experience and... And just the significance it had in each of our lives. And I feel like what I loved about how they put the piece together is it really celebrated the impact of, of like that it made on fans' lives and, and their kind of involvement. It took me like a couple of days after the experience to like digest the whole thing. I was like stunned. Just hearing you speak there about, you know, reading the book and then the film would come out and you were reading the book and then, and then no, there'd be another film and you read the book. And then when you kind of get to the end of it and then you step away from this incredible film series, what was that like? Because I guess there's a, you know, an incredible accomplishment that you, you've done it, but also, a, well, what's what's the next book? What's the next, mm-hmm. what's the next film? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're always used to as well between films having that break. So we like finished yeah. the last film and then... Summer holidays. You know, six months, yeah, six months would come around and I had this feeling like oh I should be going back now and I'm like oh no I'm that's it I'm not going back again so it was it took me a lot longer I think after the film finished to sort of really like it took a long time of like processing it all and like finding new sort of direction and I think it kind of all happened at the same time in one's like life that you kind of feel that which is sort of like your early like late teens into 20s so I feel like I had finding who I was as we all do at that age and then also kind of closing this big chapter of my life so it was kind of an interesting time and I I mean when we finished I then was at university so I was kind of also like out of one thing into another thing it was a very transitional time I guess for probably about four years I felt like I was still kind of closing the door of that chapter. When you have these major experiences in life not a lot of people get everyone in the world watching and being with them because well you go through this huge in- incredible experience the world are there with you like you you brought so much and the franchise has brought so much joy to so many people who grew up with it so it's not even mm-hmm. your memories it's other people have your memories too which must feel quite incredible like you know what a legacy yeah for sure I mean when people come up to you and recognize you and talk to you about it you know they feel like you've been in their house kind of thing yeah. in their living room because they've watched you so it's a very yeah intimate intimate feeling. Since your time playing Ginny, you have played some roles, but you've also kind of directed too, kind of from behind Mm -hmm. the camera. And what made you want to to do that? Yeah, sure. I guess from being exposed to sort of the whole film industry, not just acting. When I was making Harry Potter, I became so in love and interested in like all the behind the scenes things and how all these pieces make up a film. You know, there's so many elements to that story making. And I kind of was really interested in like, being involved in the concept of the ideas Mm -hmm. and the writing and development of them, not just kind of being on set. So when I went to university, I went to film school and I studied directing and writing and then wanted to do, I think I also wanted to just suddenly get down to a much more independent, like small scale filmmaking. So then I yeah did short films out of university and music videos. um, And I've continued to do that and hopefully soon we'll, go back to that and hopefully begin to like transition to more like feature length projects. And I think, yeah, I just love it. I just loved being, I've always loved being in team kind of group environments. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, making a film at an independent scale and being more kind of director role, you get to kind of collaborate with every single person. Mm -hmm. And I just love that. And I was quite kind of, after being in front of the camera for so long, I was pretty happy to be behind. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I said, you you have written, produced, directed two films so far. And the debut one uh, was a separate We Come, separate We Go, that premiered at Cannes Film Festival. So that must feel, it must, because, you know, you've done so many premieres with Harry Potter and they're big, but to kind of go somewhere, it's kind of your baby. Yeah. How does, how does that feel? Is that like a different, is is it the same excitement as as, as the big world premieres of, of the big movie? Uh, I think it's to- yeah, totally different because like you say, you're like involved in this small little project and you're like with the people that you made it. It feels same level excitement, but just a whole different, more kind of intimate, I guess, experience. Mm-hmm. It's just like the scale is totally different. And I think, yeah, film festivals are a very different thing because whilst you're there to share your film, it's a more collective thing too mm-hmm. because every day there are hundreds of films like you know, coming out mm-hmm. while you're there. It's nice to be around it, to be immersed in it. Yeah, yeah, I definitely loved it. I felt like a real, like, 
cinema fan. I'm someone who loves music video. Back in the day, I remember like when I first started MTV, like music videos were everything. The story you could tell mm-hmm. in three or four minutes. Um, I know you've been directing quite a few. You directed one for a song by Peter Yorn and Scarlett Johansson. Mm-hmm. How was that experience? Yeah, that was fun. I had always wanted to direct a music video with like dance element to it. So it was kind of filmed in like a bar in LA during yeah. the day. And it was really fun. I think what's so fun about music videos is you already have the the song. So you can bounce off so many ideas because there's already like a, a structure there. And it's quite freeing, I think, as a director, because particularly the stuff I've directed, I've written as mm-hmm. well. So with music videos, you have this whole thing to just like start with. It's a kind of good step up. And you can, as you said, you can kind of go anywhere. It's like quite a huge spectrum of stories you can tell. Well, congratulations and thanks for joining me under the spotlight. Thank you. That song there is Pete Yorn and Scarlett Johansson's song, Iguana Bird. And that's the uh, video we were talking about, which was directed by my under the spotlight guest, Bonnie Wright. And her new mm-hmm. book, Go Gently, Actionable Steps to Nurture Yourself and the Planet, is out now. Listening to that interview yeah. were my news feeders who were with me all morning. Now, before we go, we always give the last word to our under the spotlight guest. And this week, it's the turn of actor, activist and author, Bonnie Wright. The last meal you cooked from scratch. Ooh, um, I made a very weird mixed risotto that was from different greens I was growing in my garden from like carrot tops, oh. like the greens of carrot tops, yeah. uh, kale and rocket. It was quite a crazy green risotto. It beats beans on toast. That is, that's yeah, although I love beans on toast. <laughs> I do love some beans on toast. You can't beat it. Um, the last thing you binged on telly. What have you been watching recently on telly? Ooh, um... I just binge watch 1883, which is the prequel to like Yellowstone, which I hadn't seen. And mm-hmm. now I'm on to Yellowstone. And I usually am not much of a TV binge watcher, but I've really these last few weeks been going for those two shows. And finally, Bonnie, the last time you felt proud. Ooh, um, well, honestly, seeing my book for the first time, opening the box mm-hmm. and seeing my book, it's a pretty proud moment. You gotta give it the smell. But yeah, I'm like, it's real paper. Um, Yeah, not much in my life or I think many people's lives these days can be like a physical object, like so much is online or it's digital and to actually hold like a book that I can kind of have forever and it lasts felt pretty, pretty special. 